Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this live stream event. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to quickly review two items, our code of conduct and our event guidelines. So the Microsoft Reactor seeks to provide a respectful environment for both our audience and our presenters. We encourage engagement in the chat, but we just ask that you're mindful uh, with your commentary remaining professional and on topic. This session is being broadcast live um, today and will be available on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube in 48 to 72 hours. If you've not been on a live event before and you're tuning in from either YouTube or Twitch um, or one of the other channels that we've got streaming to at the moment, just make sure that you are signed in so you can interact in the chat. Um, if you've not set up an account with whichever platform you're joining from before and uh, you do want to interact, now is a great time to get that all sorted. So today's session, we are joined by Gwen, our regional cloud advocate here at the Reactor, and Kevin Oliver, a uh, machine learning engineer. So let's bring our speakers up. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you, as always, for that amazing introduction. I already see people in the chat. That's awesome. Kevin, how are you doing? Welcome to the session. Oh, hold on. You're muted. Let me unmute you. There we go. <laughs> You're good now. How's it going, Gwen? I'm doing fantastic. Looking forward to talking about some bicep. Yeah, we're, we're big fans of Bicep here. We just wrapped mm -hmm. up a little bit of an introductory uh, series on it, and we're going to dive a little deeper now with you. I know you're sort of a Bicep, um, what do you call those, like subject matter experts? Big fan, big fan <laughs> yeah. of Bicep, right? I know you've, mm -hmm. uh, you had your fair share of um, troubleshooting and interesting scenarios with it from what you've told me, so I'm, I'm interested to see what you've got to share with us today. Uh, before we start, I would love for you to just Give us an introduction. What do you do? How'd you get into bicep? All those kinds of things. Yeah, sure thing. So hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Oliver. I'm a machine learning engineer with the Octavian Technology Group. Um, as part of my job, I help our customers to embrace infrastructure as code as part of their journey to adopting DevOps and MLOps strategies. So trying to get everything deployed as much as possible with infrastructure as code really helps to make uh, everything smoother as we're getting resources deployed into Azure and uh, excited to dive into some of the things here that can help you do that much quicker. Awesome. Before we start, I do have a question. You've, so you primarily work now with Bicep, but have you had extensive experience with ARM? <laughs> uh, I started working with ARM okay. very shortly before Bicep came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, due to that, I definitely jumped right into the Bicep world. Um, anyone who's worked with ARM templates knows that there's a, a pretty steep learning curve coming into the product and really can be daunting if you're just starting out. So for me, uh, since Bicep was there and I saw some of the uh, possible future of where it was going, I decided I was going to jump right in and start learning then. Is, is Does Bicep have an easier learning curve, in your opinion, than, than something like ARM? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, the tooling that they've applied and um, created to, to help you create and build your Bicep files um, is fantastic. It really helps your development loop and your deployment uh, just increases the speed so much, so much faster. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Awesome. Uh, enough of my questions. Let's 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 dive in. We have a jam-packed session in terms of technical and hands-on. I would say this is more of like an intermediate level. Um, but if you are at all interested in Bicep, this is definitely a session for you. Kevin is going to do a great job at explaining. Uh, but let's go ahead and bring up your screen because I know uh, where is it? Uh, is your screen up here? Oh, there we go. Perfect. There we go. Uh, I think that is large enough. Chat. Let us know if you can see that. If you can't. Kevin might be able to zoom in just a little bit, but I mm -hmm. think that is good. Um, but yeah, let's 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 kick it off. Fantastic. All right. So before we jump into the code, I just want to give a real quick description or definition of Bicep that the Bicep team has set out on their GitHub repository. Uh, Bicep is a domain-specific language for deploying Azure resources declaratively. It helps to drastically simplify the authoring experience with a cleaner syntax, improved type safety, and better support for modularity and code reuse. Uh, 
Bicep really is built to help you deploy code in modules. So we have our, our main Bicep file, and then we can start segmenting our code out into modules to make our life easier and be able to really reuse our code without having to recreate it every time we have a new project. And so with that, we're going to sort of walk into our code that we have created today and see what we can do to apply some best practices to it and improve it and make it a little bit more module and reusable so that we don't have to rewrite this again the next time we have a new project that we're going to work on. So real quick, I'm just going to discuss some of the different components of the bicep file for those who may be new to bicep or, or uh, just want a little refresher. Uh, we're going to start out with our scoping. So every bicep file should have a target scope of where it's going to be deployed to. In our case, we're deploying to a subscription, but we do have different locations that we can do this to. We can deploy to a management group, a research group, a subscription, or a tenant. In our case, we're going to be deploying out to a subscription. The next section here, we have our parameters, which are inputs that are going to get passed into our bicep file from an external place. This might be if you're deploying via the Azure CLI or PowerShell or deploying your templates as part of a uh, Azure DevOps pipeline or GitHub Actions. Uh, these values also, if you don't add anything, uh, say you're deploying from the CLI with just your template, uh, it'll prompt you for each of these variables so that you can um, deploy your uh, be able to deploy your template. Uh, this gives you a little flexibility in deciding maybe I wanted to deploy this template to my dev environment or my stage or prod. Uh, it can help you to customize uh, what is being deployed out into your environment at a given time. Our next section is our variables, and those are specific to this bicep template or any templates attached to it. Usually I use these to create um, naming standards for the resources that are going to be deployed. In this case, we are creating a, a simple naming standard of product and then component and environment and location. So just able to give a nice consistency to the resources that we're deploying into this uh, Azure instance. And then next up, we have our resources, which are the primary things that you're deploying as part of, of BICEP. Uh, every resource represents some type of Azure service that um, you are deploying out into Azure someplace. Uh, in this case, we are deploying out our resource group, and we're also going to be deploying a virtual network in a um, BICEP module here in a second. Since we are deploying it to the subscription, when we're deploying our virtual network, we have to scope it to a different level. Since um, the resource group is where we want to create the virtual network inside of our resource group, we can't. We have to deploy it as part of a module. It can't be scoped to the same subscription level. We look at our virtual network real quick. And a handy shortcut, if you just hold down Control and left click, you can jump right into your virtual network file. So there's no need to have to go over to your documents to open your files manually there. I had no idea you could do that. That is yeah. cool. <laughs> There's some quick jumps. Uh, it really makes uh, jumping around files, especially mm -hmm. longer files, very useful. Um, so the same thing here. Module files are should be uh, self-enclosed. You have all of your parameters and variables that you're going to be deploying, that you're going to use to deploy the resources inside of that file. So in our case here, we have, again, some parameters we're going to use to deploy our uh, virtual network. And we have our virtual network name and our subnet name. We're going to minimize this out of the way. And then you can see that we are deploying just a virtual network with a subnet. So the way that this is configured now, it, it's very static. It's very brittle. Um, it doesn't really allow us to be flexible and deploy, say, multiple subnets. If I wanted to do that, I would have to copy all of this code and create a new subnet and pass in a bunch of more parameters. So it doesn't offer us a lot of flexibility to be able to change up our code um, very easily. So we're going to try and make some improvements to this. Uh, our last thing here is our output. Uh, this is passing out the virtual network ID from our deployment. This can be used in later parts of a uh, Azure DevOps pipeline or GitHub Actions to access those resources or to be used in additional modules. So with that, we're going to look at some of the parameters that we're passing into the file since we've talked about parameters a little bit. Let me know, Gwen, if that. That looks good. Should, that looks good. OK. Mm -hmm. So all of our parameters will match up with a parameter that's being passed into our um, passed in from our parameter files. There's a couple different ways to get your parameters into your deployment. Um, I like to use parameter files because it allows me to define 
parameters based on environments or applications. Uh, there's other ways. Um, another way that's one of the uh, best practice Microsoft goes for is config maps, where you put all of your values into your bicep template and then you don't have any additional files. You know, a lot of people like to go that route. For me, having the template or the parameter file separate really allows me to modularize the code and make it reusable across multiple projects without having to worry about going in and changing. Well, this project only has a dev and production environment. Well, this one has a dev and a stage and a QA. And now we're still going to end up with a little bit of um, difference between some of our modules where we could uh, control all that via the parameter file. You you said config maps? Config maps, yeah. So essentially what that is, is taking, instead of having parameters here, mm -hmm. we would um, set all of these values in a uh, block of code. So we would have a object that would contain, say, a dev and prod stage, and then all the values for those um, for that environment would be part of that config map. And then so when you went to go deploy to dev, um, you would just uh, map out some of that. And I'll show a little example of what a mm -hmm. config map looks like um, as we update some of our code here. OK. But so looking at our parameter file, for those who haven't seen it before, there's a lot of basic values. Um, we're passing in strings. We're passing in some arrays. Uh, but again, we're still not passing a lot of um, we're not passing any real complex objects or we're not ha having a lot of flexibility that allows us to deploy multiple resources or in this case subnets what we're going to aim to do uh, easily so what i'm going to do is make a little update to our parameter file here to get in something that's a little bit more flexible that we can use going forward and then we're going to talk about this in a second and i'm going to make this the full screen so we can see what's here so now we have a a number of new properties. And we're going to just focus on the subnets to start. So instead of having each subnet property as its own value, uh, subnet name, a subnet IP address, and range, we're going to go ahead and create an object to hold all of these things. And this is just an array of subnets that has every property that each subnet's going to need to be deployed. So we have our the name for our subnet. We have our subnet prefix. Uh, delegations that are going to be applied, um, any of the properties that you would use to deploy on a subnet, you can set here. And with this format, it really it allows me to really easily add a third subnet if I wanted to. So I need to come in here and add a database subnet. I can go ahead and just copy and paste that code in. And as part of the module that we're going to update, we'll be able to go through and it will use loops to deploy all of these out without having to do, write any additional code into our template. Pull that out here. And we're going to save our template. Um, as I was mentioning before about that config maps, so we have a locations list. Previously, we were just passing in our location, which was in this case, North Central US that we were going to deploy our resources to. Here, we're going to have a mapping of North Central US to a short name for NCN US. So we're not taking up so many characters as part of our deployment name. Um, one of the uh, bicep best practices that Microsoft likes to show is is doing a config map similar to this with all the parameters that you would use inside of your bicep template so that you can um, avoid having to have external files like a parameter file to do your deployments with. We're also going to be pushing some DNS servers up to uh, as part of our deployment just to show a variety of different fields that you can pass as part of, part of your properties. So by by using arrays with your parameters, it's it's cleaner, obviously, but that means within your bicep file, you, like you mentioned, you'll just have to iterate over them? Correct, yeah. So we're going to add in a little looping to help us go through these okay. and verify um, what gets deployed where and when. So we're going to jump back into our, well, actually, we're going to jump into our main file first and do a little updating of it so that we can get ready to accept these new parameters that we just added. Let's do these sections. So this is going to look a lot different than what we just had previously. 
And what I've done is paste it in a more best practice version of what your parameters can look like uh, when you're finishing up a, a bicep template. Whenever you're passing in parameters, you definitely should try and add some type of a description to it. Let everyone who's going to be using this file after you know what these are for. Um, we've also updated some of the names and the formats of the names to provide a nice consistent naming experience for all of our parameters. And we're going to do the same thing with our variables and, and um, resource groups as well. Uh, choosing a naming standard will really help you in the long run be able to make sure that whether it's just you or you and your organization who are writing templates uh, has a nice consistent feel anytime you open up a template either written by yourself or another teammate. Um, not choosing a standard and just letting anyone do what they want as far as naming goes can really make it difficult and a much more complex template to understand what this value is or what this parameter is for without having to uh, dig into the file and really jump around a bit to understand what's going on with it. And with that, we're going to do a little bit more updating here. Right, and now we're going to do a little update with our variables as well. And you can see I've, I've broken up my variables a little bit as far as what I'm going to use for creating environment names and um, group names. I like to control my naming standard through uh, the variables here. Uh, that way, if whenever I'm updating uh, names for a resource or something in a module, all I have to do is go and update the variable, and all those locations where it's used will be updated. And then here you can see where we're taking advantage of that um, config mapping. So I'm passing in my location list. That's here in our file. And from there, we're going to take whatever our location is and take the value from it. So if we're passing in North Central US, we're going to get a value of NCN. Uh, NCN US. So we're getting a nice short name. And that really allows you to very easily update in the parameter file as well more locations that you're deploying to without having to come out and touch the bicep file. Again, really making sure that we only update the bicep file when we're adding new functionality, not just changing a location name or adding a new location to deployment. That should be part of your parameters. We're also going to include some tags because all of your resources should be tagged with at least by where it's, where it's being created, or if nothing else, let's choose the current date and deploy it out that way. Um, so you know the last time that it was deployed. For me, we're going to be doing a what we were creating it by. We're using the CLI today. We're going to be uh, choosing what environment we're deploying to, our current date of deployment, and the product. There's uh, multiple other different kinds of tags you can use. You can put a owner for the resource, uh, but everything should get tagged in some way. Does does Bicep enforce you to have tags, or is that just a best practice you've picked up along the way? It does not enforce you to use tags, but I, for me, it's a best practice. Uh, I mm -hmm. don't want to deploy something that doesn't have a tag. It also helps you to understand as well if um, this created by one as I like to use, uh, especially during like DevOps pipelines. If inside of a subscription, everything's supposed to be being deployed via a pipeline, then if I see something that doesn't have tags assigned or something that doesn't have a has a created by with no value in it, then mm -hmm. I know it might be something that someone deployed by hand and didn't deploy from a pipeline. Uh, it's also a great way to understand which pipeline deployed this resource. If I've got 15 resources being deployed across five different pipelines, um, it may be difficult to know exactly where it came from without doing a little digging. Got it, got it. Just debugging purposes, the more the... Yeah, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we're going to update some of our additional resources here just to keep our naming standard going. So uh, I keep my variable names, resource names, uh, all the names as verbose as possible because I'm not 100% sure who the next person is going to be using this file is. It might be me. It might be a customer. Um, it might be a coworker. So the more description I can put in the file so that they can understand what is being used for, I think is better. Um, that might be verbo too verbose for some people, but uh, it, it does work for me. And then we're going to do our last update for our module, our, our VDN module. And um, fantastic. So as we can see, we've got a couple of errors here. And this is something that I did want to bring up. Well, 
would be a good point. So one thing that I forgot to mention that I did want to bring up before um, is creating our bicep configuration file, though. So for those who haven't used a bicep config file before, um, it is a set of linting rules that allow you to uh, control what um, how your code can work. And uh, a linter for those who haven't used it before is a static code analysis tool where you can set up rules around certain things that can or can't happen with inside of your code. So in this case, I'm just going to do control spacebar and check out what properties we have available here. And I'm going to set up a rule for no parameter, no unused parameters, or set this to a level of warning. We're going to do the same thing for our variables. And then look at this IntelliSense. I mean, just by a few clicks, you know, control space bar, I can see what yeah, values awesome. are available to me. <laughs> you know, if I need to check out what available what values are here, all the different values are available to me. So I know these are my options. I don't have to go out to the documentation. I don't have to go and hunt down with somebody what the value should be for this. Um, they make it all available to you from the IDE. So you don't have to go anywhere to check anything else. Um, one other rule that I really like to add to is um, there we go. No hardcore locations. This is one I like to have. I don't want anybody to ever set up a hardcoded location where they're putting things. Um, with this created, and this was just created at the root of our um, project. If I go back here and I change our location to be central US, now I've got a red squiggly. My bicep config file is already picked up and it's telling me that I can't statically set this value here. I have to pass in a variable with the value for where it's going to go to. If I was trying, if I was to try to do this deployment now, it would actually fail and give me an error mm -hmm. saying that. Um, this. Oh. We're going to terminate that. I have, I have other errors that are going to fail it right now. Um, you try to actually deploy this with the error in it, it would fail out as well. So we're going to back to location. We're going to jump back into our virtual network module and do our update there as well. And we're going to do the same thing here, just updating some parameters and getting them into a little bit more of a um, best practice standard for how I like to set mine up. Um, a lot of people to set their parameters and their variables and their resources together in groups. And I guess that's more of like a personal preference. You know, do you want to keep all of the related pieces together or do you want to group them together by the type? Um, you know, again, this comes back to the idea of making sure that you set a standard with you within your team or if you're working yourself so that whenever you create new files, they're all created the same way. And it'll save you a lot of troubleshooting as to later on as to what's going on and uh, where different resources are and uh, how things should just be created. Update on our virtual network here. All right. Look at this. This is significantly different than the, uh, the mm -hmm. previous virtual network that we were deploying. So if we look at some of our parameters, so we're passing in our subnet our array of subnets is going to have all the information that we're going to use to deploy our virtual network. Uh, we have the address prefix for the um, virtual network itself. Um, and we have the DNS information that's going to get passed in as well. So right off the bat, um, as you can see, we're going to be doing a loop to deploy all of our subnets. So if you haven't used loops in uh, BICEP before, essentially at any of the different properties that allow you to do 
um, that allow you to pass in arrays, you can use loops to deploy multiple resources at the same time. So what this is telling us is that for every object in the subnet of a, in our subnet array, we're going to go ahead and apply the value for all these properties. If we, let me know if that's too small. I think that's good. So if we look at our, our properties here, we are creating our name based off the name value. We're applying our subnet prefix. And then for some of our other optional properties here, we're actually using a special function called contains. This is checking that subnet array to see if a value for service endpoint exists. If it does, it's gonna go ahead and apply that value here. If not, it's just gonna give it a blank value. And this really is um, a nice way to add flexibility with inside of your modules. Uh, each deployment may not be the same. Maybe I have a deployment that doesn't need service endpoints and one that does. By configuring our virtual network resource this way, we're able to allow it to be used across multiple different deployments without having to create special deployments each time for the specific properties that are being set during that deployment. Um, if we look at if we look at our parameter file one more time, even even in the subnets we're deploying, we have a private endpoint network policy in one. Um, but if we were to add uh, a private link, this private link service policy here into our second, it would still deploy as part of our deployment because it's going to go ahead and check to see whether it exists or not, and it's got a default value if it doesn't. So it really makes it easy to uh, expand and modify your code or modify your deployments. Mm -hmm. So just like that, now I've got two different subnets are being deployed with two different sets of properties, and uh, it still will work. I don't have to do any modification to my bicep file, um, and then anyone else can do the same thing. Uh, now, there's a lot of properties that I don't have set here as well. Um, as you start to add those properties in as part of your deployment, um, you can expand the bicep file here, and that's where you should. That's the only time you should really be doing that expansion is when you have a new deployment that needs a new property added in here. So you're providing a way for uh, technicians or users to pass in a value or so that it has a default value. Um, again, we see that here with our DHCP options. We're passing in DNS server, or we're passing in values for the DNS servers. Um, if we don't pass in a value, we're gonna set it's it to null. null. Mm -hmm. And this is a special one, a little bit of a special one, because we had to set the, the um, expected shape of the values beforehand. Um, we aren't able to do it during uh, in this DHCP section. Mm -hmm. um, so I create a variable to handle that. So at the top, your only parameter is essentially the array of like the subnet, right? You're, you're not individually having to call like subnet IP range or anything like that, or subnet one name, cool. subnet two, right? Exactly. For all the subnet information, that's all just one array is being passed that's, in. So that's and one parameter that holds all of that, essentially. Yes, and exactly. Instead it. of having to have all of them. And you could Very even cool. get more complex with this and say everything in an environment, you could have an environment array that just has all of the different uh, resource values there for it as well. Um, uh, there's some good, ex good examples on GitHub um, for uh, uh, really complex deployments where you're they're actually deploying like whole subscriptions with mm -hmm. just a parameter file and all the deployment pieces into it. Have you ran into any issues with that approach? So far, no. Um, one of the big issues that I know I've run into with some things is uh, nested for loops. So sometimes you run mm -hmm. into resources where you have an array of res array of, uh, array of properties, and then there's going to be another set of properties in, underneath that. You can't nest for loops inside of a bicep, and uh, not yet. Uh, hopefully, that will be something that they'll be able to fix in the future. I know it's been brought up before on community calls and such. Um, but to get around that, sometimes you may have to create another module to act like that loop and get the, the values you want, and then pass that into the um, the array below it. So that uh, that's another thing that actually we Hopefully, we'll be able to show in uh, the next session. Mm -hmm. um, but for here, we are just going to go and make sure this is up to date and uh, verify everything looks good. OK. All right. Um, so now we have all of our updated code. Uh, 
for those who haven't seen it before, we're just going to check out the visualizer to make sure everything looks nice and just review what we're deploying. Um, nice feature if you don't know about it, it bicep, the bicep tooling ships with a built-in visualizer so you can see all the uh, representation of the resources you're deploying. Um, once you get into say temp deployments that have 10, 15 modules, it's really nice to be able to see all the interdependencies between all of your resources. Uh, it can already tell that my virtual network's going to get deployed into the resource group, that there is a um, dependency on that. So really nice to be able to see that. And then sometimes, you know, if nothing else, it's a great way to have your documentation uh, made for you. All right, and then we're just gonna Going to go ahead and verify that this all works. I'm uh, I'm assuming you're using Oh My Posh for your. <laughs> I am yes. Uh, I am using okay. Oh My Posh for my. Um, uh, yeah, for my command line there. Yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, you're going to have to um, share your config because I'm really liking it. It is. Uh, it, it's actually a built-in one. Um, it is uh, Pixel Robots. It's. Um, oh, okay. I'll have to uh, check it he out. is. A, he is an MVP out of the UK, um, but it's it's in their GitHub repository now, so you can you can grab it. It's it's very nice. I also like it. Um, he says he's been working on a new one, so I'm excited to see the uh, updates he'll make to it. Very sweet. I've always wanted to do my own. Maybe I I, I might spend some time <laughs> doing it. Would be neat. Fantastic. Um, so. As our deployment, we can always do our, we should always be doing our validation first. Uh, whether you're doing it via CLI or PowerShell, you know, validate, make sure your script looks good. Uh, we have a successful validation. And then we can also throw in our what if command as well. Great. And no, that one's not going to work. What if is not the right one? What if we'll take the validation step um, just a little farther and try and pre-create the resources and see what it's what you're going to uh, show your representation of what you're going to get if you do this deployment? Mm, I didn't know that. Is that part of the Azure CLI or part of the Bicep CLI? Uh, that is part of it's part of both. Um, so it is it is in the Azure CLI and mm -hmm. um, uh, the same team owns it. But uh, so like in this case. I, I ran the wrong command first. So, but what we should have seen was that there was actually going to be a creation here. But so mm -hmm. this is a good good to see here as well. So, uh, we have resources and properties cool. that are going to be changing. Um, we have some information that's going to be updated. So, apparently, the private endpoint network policy is expecting a capital E in enabled, and I was passing in a lowercase. So it's going to change that for me as part of the virtual network that I um, already have created. Uh, but this is a great way to preview some of the changes you're going to see as part of your deployment. And um, there are some limitations. Um, there was actually just a, a learn live session on this yesterday, uh, as far as some of the what if capabilities and things are working on. Um, there, if you have modules nested inside of modules, uh, the what if is not capable of rendering those out yet. So um, there is some limitation to seeing all of the changes that are happening, but it is something that they're looking to try and fix and, and extend so you can see all of your changes throughout as many nested modules as what you're working on. Um, but you know, think of this as if you're working in um, you know, a DevOps pipeline. I've got my templates in a repository, and I, I make a, a PR or, or a push up to get it changed. As part of that, one step can be a what if that gives you this output as part to see in the PR and see what changes are going to be happening. And then that'll just give you a nice little verification for anyone reviewing it, you know, what's actually changing as part of this template update without having to jump through the code a lot to see. Also some unattended consequences too, if uh, you change something on accident. Very cool. Yeah, the, the tooling, like you mentioned earlier, like the ARM tooling versus the bicep tooling, it's just, it's a bicep is unmatched. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to be able to navigate your files so much faster. Um, mm -hmm. Another great example is uh, if we're doing, you know, say current date, any of our parameters or variables, to be able to jump back and forth across from 
from where it is to where it's being used or where it's located. So I have a location parameter here. I need to jump to it, control left click, and there you are, you're right back up to where it is. Uh, for large in-depth files with lots of resources, not having to scroll halfway down your file to try and figure out where something's being used is fantastic. Um, if we jump into the network arrays, do I have one? If we had a value that was used in multiple locations, if um, my environment was used in multiple locations, it's going to tell me all the different locations it's used in. So now I can decide which one I want to jump wow. to and go uh, check it out. That is, that's neat. So it, it's really fantastic to be able to quickly find the reference that you need and um, you know update accordingly without having to do a lot of scrolling or a lot of hunting. So Very it's, neat. It's, yeah, the, the the tooling that they built is 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 top notch, and it's just getting better. Um, there there's so much more they're still looking to add, and they're uh, still not even to a 1.0 release. So I'm I'm very excited to see what new features we're going to be seeing down the pipeline. Um, and with part of that, um, so I'm going to jump over and just check our deployment. Can I switch my screen? Is that good? Yeah, let me let me remove it, and then that way you can switch, and then let me know when to add it back up. Fantastic. Uh, but let's see, a couple of people here uh, telling us traceability, one of the best practices. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, if you uh, add that back in. Awesome. Can we make it a little wider? Yes. Yes. We and can. then we'll probably want to zoom in. There we go. Can we zoom in? Maybe like. Ooh, I think that's good. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. Fantastic. So we have our bicep demo files that we're working with, and we have our virtual network that was deployed. We have our tags that we added, and we have our naming convention, which is applied to all the resources underneath it as well. And if we look at our subnets, because those are the ones that we have uh, different um, we've set different configurations on. So we have our first one that has its first service endpoints. And then we have our second one that has its three service endpoints. And it looks like I messed up the delegation setup. Um, so I'll have to go back and check that. But uh, again, this is a great way to understand that you can control um, deployment of different types of resources with the same template uh, without having to go in and modify that template. As much as you can, trying to make the template flexible so that it can take different values in depending on the deployment you're using, will go a long way to making your templates very reusable and generalized so that others can use it um, in a, can, can reuse it without having to um, recreate it or modify it. And then you end up with duplicate files everywhere and trying to decide which is the right one to go with can be, uh, can be difficult. Yeah, I've, what I've learned, so, well, I guess the overarching uh, theme is abstraction is the goal but I, I could also see how if you're a beginner and you're kind of looking at this it might be like difficult to be like well what's going on why is or are all the subnets in one parameter in one parameter oh it's an array oh like what's going on here yeah um, and that, that's definitely a piece that's difficult to just pick up and and work on um and that was a tough thing for me as well because i wanted to just you know i, I need subnet one subnet two and working with the json files is still still is a challenge, right? Yeah. Um, we have, uh, um, I wish there was a better way. And I know that there's been talk about trying to create some type of a, a bicep parameter file, mm -hmm. which will just create that JSON. Um, doesn't sound like anything's happened yet, but you know, head out to the bicep uh, GitHub repository and you can always raise an issue or a feature request to uh, help get that moved along. Absolutely. All right, I see your Visual Studio code back up. Yes, so there was one last piece I wanted to show as far as um, features to uh, help you create your, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> as ways to help you mm -hmm. uh, extend your uh, bicep template. So in the background here, I'm just going to go ahead and create a network security group. And we're going to ingest that from bicep file because uh, no one wants to have to create all those rules by hand. All 
All right. So what we're going to be doing, and while this is deploying, is we're going to be using a feature in Bicep for inserting resources that are created out in Azure. So not all the time you know all the properties you're going to want to put into a resource, or you've never worked with a certain resource before. So instead of maybe having to fumble through you know, the API documentation or trying to work it out from inside of Bicep, um, you can go ahead and create that resource in the portal and then import it into Azure or into your Bicep template and understand some of the properties that are there. So to do this, I'm just going to grab my resource ID from the portal. And with inside of Bicep, we're going to do Control Shift P. And we're going to choose this Bicep insert resource option. And we're going to choose our virtual network file. And then we're going to part pass in the uh, resource ID that we're going to want to ingest. And what this is going to do is going to have, it's going to go out and try and generate the resource from from whatever wow. was created inside of Azure. Very cool. So now I've got a great template to start with. Mm -hmm. I can go ahead and um, see my rules are already kicking in, telling me that this is not good. So we can go ahead and update this and add our location. And uh, everything has IntelliSense, which is fantastic. So you know whether you're looking for your parameters, your variables, um, you can always find those very quickly. And I'm going to, since I don't want to have to type out these rules, um, we're going to create one more file to get those added for us. MSG. We're going to create a new JSON file, and we're going to bring in a set of rules that we we'll want our resource or our network security group to deploy. So again, we're creating a uh, array of security rules, mm -hmm. and we're passing in just two rules right now to be applied. Um, but instead of having to import those uh, ourselves, we're going to go ahead and add some variables to do that for us. So I've created a network uh, an NSG security rules variable, and we're going to use a pair of special functions to pull in our, our values for us. So the load text context function is going to go ahead and read this JSON file and import all the information for it and turn it into a variable that we can use uh, in place of the security rules array below. As you can see, all the information that's in that file is now in this uh, variable. So instead of having to type that all out, I can come down here and I can do NSG security rules, and I'm done. Uh, I, if I need to create special, if I need to have a base set of rules, and then I want to create special rules for this deployment, I can do that here, and I can concat those together if I had two sets. Um, or if it's just to keep it out of your bicep file, you can have this JSON file holding all of your rules uh, and just pass it in into one variable. It really makes everything a lot cleaner um, rather than having that big block of text in the middle of your resource and cluttering up the file, having that out in its own file, which can be easily updated as well, um, allows you to keep, again, your your, your BICEP file very modular and very generalized to be used across multiple, um, multiple deployments. We're also going to update the industry rule here. Yeah, that's way cleaner than what I've seen. Like, you know, having to individually add the network security, like individually reference the network security rules in the bicep right. file. And it works well for, for firewall rules or any mm -hmm. any large block of text. Um, I've heard people, I believe, use it for logic apps as well. I believe some of those uh, rules that come out of there are in a big block of JSON. Um, there are some limitations to it. You have to be careful that JSON file can only grow to a certain size. Uh, I, do not, I do not know off the top of my head, but I know it's out in the uh, BICEP documentation. So please go check that out to um, verify how big that file can get. because. Uh, at the end of the day, what's happening if we build our bicep file and we look at our JSON, that big block of text is being added into, um, oh, and see, this is I, th this is why, <laughs> if I had had to do just ARM templates before, it would have been insane. <laughs> um, but here, if we look at a variable, all it's doing is importing that big block of text in there for us, but we don't have to do it. It's abstracted away. We know it's there. We know it's something that we have to pass in, but we're only having to work with this variable name. So it makes 
uh, massive, are, are difference. massive difference. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And yes, if we were to deploy this again, we can see we have a our validation. We do our what if we should get a new uh, network security group that's going to get mm -hmm. deployed or updated with those two new rules. So yeah, now I, <laughs> I've realized that it's all about understanding what, like taking advantage of the different, um, what are they called, functions? Yeah, or, different uh, yeah. functions that, and, and just built-in mm -hmm. tooling that's there, right? You yeah. know, a lot of this is, is spread across multiple tools, but the, um, the efficiency that the bicep tooling that's provided to you lets you create variables and bring in other resources to get what you need without having to write big blocks of code all over the place yeah. makes your code just that much cleaner and that much faster to write uh, if i need to go out again the 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 import resource option is fantastic mm -hmm. to have a new resource you've never worked with and be able to go out and configure it and get some values in to start with it saves you a huge amount of time definitely um, now, definitely, I would say a caveat to that is uh, the insert resource will try its best to create the bicep for, file for you. It's probably not going to do a best practice. It's going to do a lot of statically set things, but it will give mm -hmm. you a starting point to be able to start creating that resource and making it more efficient for your deployments. So, yeah, we can see here we've got our two new rules that are getting created for us into our network security group. And uh, we could deploy those to Azure and we'd be all set. That we've got some updated templates that can be reused across some multiple deployments and uh, easier for people to review and read and understand going forward and uh, hopefully easier to extend as well. That is awesome. I've learned a lot. Um, we do have a, a question. This might be able to sort of segue us into talking just a little bit about what you have in store for the next session. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil's asking here is, will you be posting the code used in this demo? And I think you mentioned before we went live that um, that's something that you think about doing for the next session, like making it available on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, since we're doing a second session, I'm going to have a repository on my GitHub with this first demo, uh, essentially the essential, the initial versions of the files and the, the final ones. And then we'll have the um, second session's files there as well. We'll be doing a little bit more of a complex deployment, uh, working with uh, a bunch of different resources and several different modules, you know, deploying security and diagnostics and, and alerting at the same time. So um, those will all be available after the sessions, yes. Perfect, perfect. Uh, let me take a look here if we've got another. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes or so. Um, I don't know if you had anything else to share or we can just tackle the questions at the moment. Um, at the moment in time, no, I think that was it. Uh, we could go out to the portal and take a look at the, uh, the resources we created, but um, uh, I would say the only other thing, maybe useful things to note, uh, don't forget that you have an outlining tool as you're working through your files. So even though we have the ability to jump around to different locations to see where our, what's in our file, uh, the outline is available to let us make sure we can see uh, all of our different properties and variables and the different resources that we're creating as well. Another way for you just to understand what resources are out there for you um, <laughs> an easy way for you to navigate the different resources that are in your templates. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Just becoming in the know of like everything that the tooling offers is a session on its own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, there's so much, uh, so much power to it. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, hats off to the bicep team for, for really putting out great tooling to let bicep take off. Um, mm -hmm to be able to just step in and even working through the the number of learn modules that are out there is is fantastic. Um, you can go from just learning normal uh, single templates deployments to deploying, uh, they've got whole sections now for deploying through Azure DevOps and GitHub Actions. So you can you know learn from the beginning and get to the end where you're deploying everything from repositories as part of uh, pipelines uh, in just a couple of learn modules. Yeah, absolutely. I've gone through a couple of those. That's, I mean, essentially that's mm -hmm. how I, I learned to bicep. Do you have experience um, working with either Act GitHub Actions or Pipeline Azure DevOps? 
Yes, I do. Um, I've got several projects where we're deploying these templates through uh, Azure DevOps pipelines. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one customer, we're entirely deploying all of their resources for their dev and production environments with bicep templates. So everything is infrastructure as code, uh, app mm -hmm. services, uh, Cosmos databases, front door, um, everything is part of that. And um, the ease of updating and, and creating new uh, templates really uh, they were a little leery of starting with using biceps since it wasn't a productional tool at the time. Yeah. Um, but uh, when we did a little investigating and, and looked at creating bicep templates versus creating arm templates, um, it was mm -hmm. a nine day difference between how fast we could create the templates in bicep. And um, then we ended up with an arm template anyway. So at the end of the day, if they want to, um, I guess that's another good point to make as well. Your bicep templates all end up just transpiling down to an arm template anyway. Yeah, it's all the arm bicep anyway. tooling. Yeah, the bicep tooling is just helping you to make arm templates easier. Uh, very, very similar analogy for developers is TypeScript to JavaScript. Mm -hmm. You know, TypeScript is helping you to write good JavaScript, and it's going to compile down to JavaScript anyways. Yeah, it's a, it's like the same thing I tell people when they use the portal. Like it, the back end is all ARM. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're working with it, like an API, right? Um, Alan asks, are you using version five point six of Bicep? I am, yes. Um, six O just came out, but it actually just broke the insert resource function <laughs> that I was using as part of this demo, so I had to roll well, back. You, um, yeah, you told me that yesterday. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, they, they are they are incrementing pretty quick, um, and I'm trying to stay current with the tools as I can. Very cool. Also, Azure DevOps are better than GitHub Actions, in my honest opinion. I, I guess it's a... Oftentimes, you don't get to choose what you have to work with. You kind of work with what the company or what the customer wants. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, would, mm -hmm. I would have to agree with Alan and say I do like the templating in Azure DevOps a little bit better. Um, mm -hmm. The ability to uh, have a, say, maybe a repository of templates in the same way and be able to call those in and use them is very awesome. GitHub's getting that now with, um, I can't think of the name of it, but they now have reusable functions and modules as well. So it's definitely coming up to par. Um, mm -hmm. But Azure DevOps is, is where I, I live most of the day, too. Very, very, very cool to know. Uh, all righty. It looks like we've covered the questions. Um, I do want to share our next session. There we go. So we have Bicep Advanced Deployments Part 2. Uh, so next week, May 11th, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and that you mentioned what we're going to go over. And then you'll also make the code in the GitHub available then. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be great. And we have one last here. We'll do this one last question here. Is there a way to embed PowerShell commands in Bicep scripts? There is, yes. Um, if there is a deployment script resource where you can either embed a URI that you call PowerShell scripts from, or you can embed your, um, um, you can either embed the commands into the deployment script resource, or you can call it from, say, a GitHub repository. So it's uh, very possible to run PowerShell commands. Even AZCLI commands, I believe, can also work from there as well. Very cool. And he, one last one came in here. How do you share your bicep modules between different projects slash pipelines? Mm, that's a great question. So today, what you'd end up having to do is copy and paste them across projects, which is pretty inefficient. Um, one of the new features that the BICEP team is coming out with is called a BICEP registry. And so you'd be able to have private or public registries where you can host your modules and then call them as part of your templates um, as you're creating them. And then this provides you that um, single source of truth for what templates you're being used across your deployments. Uh, I believe the feature is out now and there's some, um, uh, there's, there are some tutorials around creating the bicep registry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bicep team also did just open, uh, Marcus opened their uh, Azure bicep registry. So if you go search GitHub under uh, the Azure group, um, there should be just the, I believe it's just the Azure bicep or the bicep, uh, Azure bicep repository. Mm -hmm. module repository. I can't remember the name. I apologize. Um, but it is out there. And uh, that'd be the ideal way to go with it is have a module module registry, and then call those modules into your template. And um, then you would have just a one source of truth that you can use across multiple projects. Okay, there's your answer. Look up module registry. And then the person asked here got a URL on that. And I'm assuming this is on the PowerShell 
Um, the PowerShell command. What was the function that you mentioned? Uh, the resource is deployment scripts. Um, okay, deployment scripts resource. I'm sure if you went and like looked that up, you would probably be able to find it. Like um, if you did like bicep um, resource. Yeah, it's it's um it's not specific to bicep, but it mm -hmm. is a um, uh, in the Microsoft resources, and it uh, yeah, it's the API is just called deployment script. Uh, if you search for the microsoft.resources slash deployment scripts, uh, that should get you to the API page. Um, if not, it'll probably come up with a bunch of samples where people are using it. Um, unfortunately, I don't have one available right now to show you what it looks like. Um, but yeah, it is definitely capable of doing it and the, the API, APIs are out there. Awesome. All righty. Um... I think we're good to go. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We'll be here next week for a final session. Uh, so if anyone has any additional questions, you can, of course, ask us then. And we're going to also share your socials in the chat uh, okay. if people want to reach out to you or you want to connect and stay in touch with what you're up to. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Rebecca, if you have anything to add. Oh, yes, a reactor page here. Uh, I think we shared this earlier in the chat, but we have content all the time on the Reactor YouTube channel. So uh, take a look at ak.ms slash Reactor YouTube, Twitter, our newsletter, our website, our meetup has all the all, all the events that we are uh, hosting. Um, yeah, that's it. We're good. I'll see you. I'll see everyone in the in the next session next week. And Kevin, thank you so much. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, everybody.